Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Today's guest- Welcome, everyone, to the Switch for Good podcast. Here we are again. I am your co-host, Dotsy, and I'm here with Alexandra. Hey, hey, she's <laughs> waving for those of you on YouTube. <laughs> A uh, woman, a few words this moment. <laughs> so Alexandra, you know, we get written all the time, uh, uh, people asking for kind of quick facts, quick, quick tips that they can share with people about what's wrong with animal foods. You know, it's super easy. I find it very easy to get in the weeds, right. And, and, and just kind of, you know, somebody says, well, what's wrong with this? Let's call, let's say dairy, right? Like what's, what's wrong with dairy? I mean, we've been doing it forever and it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, a wonderful growth fluid and uh, it's for help to help little kids grow big and strong. It has lots of protein, carbohydrates. It's got some fat. It has everything you need. And then you look at the person glassy eyed and you know, sometimes you just start crying and that's not really that effective, but it's very easy to sort of just kind of stumble on your words and, and, and get confused where, especially those of us, uh, many of our listeners who feel so passionate about the subject, I get, the more passionate I am about something, the more beclimped I can get sometimes in front of, uh, an audience or even just in front of one person who's like, give it to me straight. I want to, I want the facts. So I thought we would do a series, which I think will turn into a four part series over the next month. Uh, at the beginning of each one of our podcasts that really gives people the quick facts on what's wrong with dairy from a health perspective, from a performance perspective, because that's definitely a new arena that, that people don't know too much of the science behind, uh, from an environmental perspective, and from a food justice perspective, because that's another one that's uh, well, it's not newer, but it's newer in uh, the public consciousness and, and discussing it and thinking about what that really means and how, uh, how dairy hurts uh, people of color and how uh, communities are affected uh, by dairying. So I think I'm going to start with health because that's one that certainly is, it can be impactful because you're talking to humans and most humans care about their health, right? They care about, you know, living a long time and, and, and feeling great and having energy to, uh, for, for their, for their family and for their life. So I'm going to go down kind of like a, a, a fact list and I'm going to keep it short and sweet, right? Just like you like it, right? You like <laughs> tips, facts, like <laughs> spit them out, right? I don't want, I don't want to hear you go on and on about it. So if, in fact, people were, wanted to take some, some quick notes, you're just going to have, uh, what the, what the problem is and a sentence or two explanation. And then I'm going to, I'm going to move on. So I think I can really probably do this in like one or two minutes. So, all right. So somebody comes up to you and says, what's wrong with dairy. All right. From a health perspective, you can say, well, the milk proteins in dairy are casein and whey. Most people have heard of whey, right? Cause there's a lot of protein powders made from whey. Um, they are allergens in many, many, many people. And I don't know if you saw the, the recent news that came out. So gosh, probably about a month ago, uh, that milk has now topped nuts as, uh, the most prominent and common allergy. So there are a lot of allergens in milk proteins that are connected to impaired breathing, respiratory symptoms, runny nose, GI distress. So stomach cramps, bloating, gas, we've had multiple GI docs on the podcast talking about that. 
Uh, second, lactose. Lactose is a problem if you can't digest it, which 65% of the world's population cannot, uh, known as lactose intolerance. And that also wrecks havoc on your, on your GI tract. Um, distress, discomfort, uh, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, the list goes on. Next, D-galactose, one of the sugars found in dairy. In studies, it's been implicated in Alzheimer's and also in bone loss. What? We thought that milk really bred strong bones and made strong bones. Well, the British Medical Journal uh, study that was done uh, uh, not too long ago showed that those who drank three or more glasses of milk per day, and it can certainly be also in the form of, of, of yogurt or cheese or whatever that the milk is in, right, that makes those products, uh, three plus glasses of milk per day had a 60% higher rate of hip fracture and double the risk of death. Next, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, and its stim stimulation is implicated in many, many types of cancers. Bovine estrogens are found in milk, yummy. They are also implicated in cancers, but specifically in the hormone-dependent cancers like prostate, breast, and ovarian. And then you just have all sorts of yummy things in milk like pesticides, herbicides, bone leukemia virus, and pus cells, which just, I don't know, that's just obviously not good. Yay, Dotsie. Okay, so let me let me see if I can. Did you did you finish? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah okay. I think, yeah, for I, now. I, can go I know on for now, right? We can yeah. talk about uh, lax antioxidant and uh, saturated fats and uh -huh. cholesterol and all sorts of other yucky things. But those those are the ones that are that are strongest in in my opinion and are very specific to dairy itself. Okay, so let me just recap. So whey and casing, we uh, don't digest those well. They're bad for us. Uh, most of humans are lactose intolerant, which causes a lot of uh, physical problems and uh, distress. Uh, thirdly, um, what was the third one? Your, your favorite, but not in this form, <laughs> a sugar found in dairy known as... Oh, yes. L-galactose. Very D bad. D-galactose. <laughs> D-galactose, de D-galactose, bad for you folks, really bad because um, it can, uh, it's bad for bones. There you go. Yeah. And uh, pesticide, oh, bovine hormones, tons of hormones in, in, uh, in, uh, in cows because when they give you that milk, they're pregnant or yeah, they just had a baby. 15 plus sex hormones uh, in, in cows. And then all the pesticides that are uh, in, in chemicals that are given to cows because uh, they are what? They, why are there pesticides? Because they're eating stuff that's absolutely crap. yeah, it's what they're eating. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah mo which is mostly soy and corn. Um, and then the right so, so to just to, to to increase the the crop yield, there's pesticides and herbicides on those. So it's you know. The, okay. get rid of the weeds and all the things that take those crops out and the bugs that take those crops out. Right. So you want a bigger, bitter yield, uh, more crop, you're going to use those. Um, and the bovine leukemia virus is in so much milk and I don't know about you, but I'm feeling like we don't need any more viruses in our systems floating around. Yeah. They've actually done studies to mm -hmm. see if there's a link between bovine leukemia virus and, yep. uh, breast cancer in women. And they have found links so I'm surprised more women aren't horrified by that. Uh, but anyway, thanks, Dotsie. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, round one uh, out of four, maybe more, of um, quick tips on how to help people understand why it's good to stay off dairy. Um, we, our guest today actually is a really perfect guest to follow you because he's mm -hmm. talked us a lot about the emotional reasons why people stick to eating these animal foods. And so stay tuned, folks. Yeah, let's dive in. Today's guest actually came to us and oh, we are so glad he did. David Blatt is the author of a new book, The Vegan Imperative, Why We Must Give Up Meat and Why We Don't. As a vegan for over 30 years, David was constantly confounded by the idea that good, kind people continue to eat animals. So he wrote a book about it. David is also a former animal law attorney and previous executive director of Vegan Action, the nonprofit that has certified over 10,000 products worldwide with a trademark that was David's idea. David also makes his own tahini and tofu, which is just a fun fact that I had to share. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, David. 
Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you went vegan way before Alexander and I did, way back in 1988. I know from researching about you that you did it for ethical reasons, but wondering what prompted you initially to think about making the switch and what was so what was so compelling that made you completely reject societal norms, especially back then and, and journey down this lifestyle? Okay. Uh, it actually started when I was 12, unfortunately, after a tragedy. My father died in a sudden accident. And what happened after that, I all of a sudden became very attuned to suffering. And it wasn't just my suffering, my family's, but I looked at the animals all around me. I was living in the woods in a suburb of New York and I saw suffering everywhere. And I realized, you know, these animals, they want to live just like I do. They suffer just like I do. So I kind of sat with that. I didn't really do anything, but this was the 19, late 1970s. And you, you probably don't remember, um, but the anti-fur movement was big at the time. And I remember, you know, really feeling a strong kinship with the anti-fur movement uh, because of this sudden awareness. But I wasn't vegetarian at the time. So then I went to college. And when I was 18, I was having a conversation and someone offhandedly remarked, you know, there's really no difference between fur and eating meat. They're both unnecessary. One is for taste, one is for vanity, but you don't need to do either one. And that really struck a chord with me. And I had a pretty big decision to make. You know, on the one hand, I was a big, um, but I also, you know, I had a sense that I was causing suffering to animals, I was hurting animals. And I didn't want to keep doing that. So I thought about it, I didn't do it immediately. It's hard, as, as you may have experienced. I think most people find the initial decision very hard, but I finally made that decision. I went vegetarian. And fortunately, at, at the time, it was just after the publication of the book, um, Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Moore LePay. So there was some awareness about vegetarianism. It wasn't until 11 years later, I was in law school and I went to an exhibit by PETA and I became aware of the treatment of farmed animals and I had no idea. And at that point, I decided to go vegan. In fact, I had never even heard the word vegan before I went vegan. Um, it was at that exhibit. I also read the book Animal Factories and, and saw pictures, which is very important. And I also, I came to the conclusion there's just as much harm in eating dairy and eggs as there is in eating meat. So I became vegan and that was 1988. So, so Dasi, we have to have Francis Marlepe on the show because several <laughs> people have mentioned her book and David, that's the reason I became vegetarian when I was 14 as I read her book and it was for environmental reasons. Uh -huh. um, so you, you became vegetarian in college after that, uh, uh, you were sort of confronted with the moral dilemma of the fact that you were against fur, but you were still eating meat? Yes. Unfortunately, in my college, they did have a vegetarian option, which I think was very rare at the time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to starve. You were a public defender for four years. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm imagining that you had a, uh, an argumentative way about you, or you could argue very effectively. And you've, you've said that in the beginning, when people ask you why you were a vegetarian and then vegan, um, that you responded in a, in a fairly confrontational and argumentative way. But what helped you to kind of move from that way of communicating with people to kind of a more um, philosophical way? And we're gonna talk about that in a bit and, and definitely more of an engaging way to actually get them to hear you. Well, a few things happened, and I actually talk about my evolution in the book. It's kind of a slow process. But as you say, I was raised very argumentative. My best friend and I in high school, we would disagree about anything. If he was a Yankee fan, I had to be a Met fan. If he liked one politician, I had to like his opponent. It was just, it was ingrained that way. We would go to family dinners. People would be arguing back and forth. There'd be five conversations, everyone shouting at each other. That was standard. So I went to law school, I became a public defender. And when you're in court, it's the same thing. You're arguing all the time. Um, you're arguing against the district attorney. Sometimes you're arguing against the judge. So 
what happened, I was doing it for four years and I ended up in this one courtroom. I was put there for three months. I still remember the judge he was kind of this big rough guy. Every day, this judge had to yell at someone. And normally it would be some attorney who wasn't a public defender, a district attorney. He would just start yelling at them for no reason. One day in court, this is about three months in, nothing was going on, but he needed to yell. He started yelling at the back wall. I mean, screaming at it, just yelling at it. Afterwards, he stops and says, oh, I feel better. That kind of woke me up. I, I went back to my office and said, hmm, maybe there's something not quite right here. And I actually quit the public defender's job uh, just a few weeks after that and became a high school teacher, which my parents did. So at that point on, I just started becoming you know, aware of, of the confrontation aspect and trying to lessen it. I also read the book, um, Dale Carnegie's How to Make Friends and Influence People. I think that's the title. How to Win Friends and Influence how to, how to win. There you go. Um, <laughs> and it was just a great book. I just, I just learned a lot. You know, people, you don't win arguments. You never win arguments. You, you convince people by persuading them and also by being a role model. So it's more effective. And I think for one's personal you know, health and way of life, it's much more wholesome. Mm -hmm. That book what? had a big influence on me too. Uh, David, yeah. we must have the same <laughs> reading list. Um, Sorry, Dotsie, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to dive into that book because I'd love to know a few tips from it, like on how to really influence people that you pulled, that you're, uh, you pulled from that you, you know, still probably today use in influencing people to consider changing their diet, not making them change their diet. Right. One of the interesting tips, I remember a few of them is, is you, you, you kind of have the person come to it on his or her own. So they actually think it's their idea. And in some ways it is. And that's more effective than telling them this is, this is what you need to do. Um, so that will be more lasting and more positive for them. There, I think I've, it's been a long time since I read it, but um, it, it's definitely worth a read. Yeah, we make our own decisions, right? As humans, we don't make decisions because other people tell us to make the decision that way. In fact, that's a great way to go in the opposite direction and to make people leave the conversation and go eat a cheeseburger immediately. Exactly, exactly. In your book, you decided to write a book, The Vegan Imperative, Why We Must Give Up Meat and Why We Don't. You examine the psychological processes that keep people, from, keep people eating meat. Tell us the story about your friend Mike, uh, which you talk about at the beginning of your book, um, and how people like him inspired you to, to write the book. Right, so um, I, I've been thinking about this issue pretty much ever since I became vegetarian. And something happened, it's probably been 10 years now. And I have this friend, Mike, he's a very good friend. In fact, we're business partners. And he's also very kind and compassionate. He's a doctor and I can tell he really cares about his patients. So, and I don't, and, and this is probably pretty common. I don't really talk directly to him about it. Um, you know, my friends, I just let them be. And if it arises, it arises but he heard me talk about it over the years. So one day, quite out of the blue, he goes, Dave, you know, I've heard your arguments for veganism over the years and I have to tell you something. I agree. So there's a pause. He goes, but I'm still going to eat meat. And to me, you know, I don't, I don't really understand it. Even after writing this book, I don't really understand it. I think I have greater insight into people's psychology but you know, it's, it's a question because I would say most of my friends are not vegan and many of them are not vegetarian. And they're all, all my friends are compassionate and kind and are trying to make a positive influence in the world, but they continue to eat meat. And you know, it is in a sense befuddling, but uh, there, are, there are a bunch of psychological issues that I go into in the book. Talk to us a little bit about why uh, some of the reasons, even though you might not have come across one for sure, some mm. of the reasons you think people continue to eat meat, even though they know that it's cruel, they know factory farming is terrible, they know it's not very good for their health, they know it's bad for the climate. Right. Um, so there's a lot of ways to approach it, but I can just single out some that I think are particularly important. I think the single most important is the way we're raised. 
you know, when you're raised and taught to believe something and, you know, for 10, 20 years, it's taught by your parents, it's taught by society, you tend to believe it. Most of the beliefs that I hold were beliefs instilled in me. Some basic ones like democracy. I believe in democracy. If I had been raised in a communist society, would I believe in democracy? So people are, are taught that eating meat is okay. I think that's probably the single biggest issue. It's very hard for people um, not to, it's very hard to challenge what society tells people. So you have to first be ready to challenge it. And then if you reach a conclusion different than society, you have to in a sense challenge society. Now, when I started and, and when you became vegetarian, um, it was a lot different than now. And that's another reason I wrote the book. Back in the 70s and 80s, people would make fun of you if you were a vegetarian. No one knew what vegan was. Um, even in 2000, when I was executive director of Vegan Action, people didn't know what vegan was. You know, we, we instituted the logo, catered to a very small audience. A couple of years ago, this was, this was a pivotal moment for me. Um, the SAG Awards announced that their annual dinner, this is on TV, would be plant-based. When I heard that, I knew veganism had arrived. And really, I mean, it's everywhere. Um, you know, there's Beyond Meat, there's the Impossible Burger. I think Burger King is carrying the Impossible Burger. So it's just really become more accepted now. So I think it's easier for people to become vegan. But it is still a challenge. You are, you are challenging societal norms. I mean, it's still the norm to eat meat. And that's hard for people to do. So David, what I'm hearing is that, because I know Dotsie and I were both raised in households that had meat. In fact, I think 99% of my vegan friends were raised in households where they were told that meat was just something you ate. And so I'm hearing from you that com compassion and kindness isn't necessarily a factor in whether you're vegan or not. There has to be some kind of maybe a rebellion, thinking out of the box quality. What are some of the qualities that you believe that people who go vegan or, or even vegetarian or make even a step have that people who don't like your friend Mike don't have, even though he's kind and compassionate. Right, I mean, one of my theories, and this is just a theory, I think, and again, it depends on why you become vegan. And the first part of the, the book is divided into two parts. The first part talks about why vegan. The second goes into why not vegan, why are people not vegan? So a lot um, depends on your motivation. You know, I was originally motivated by ethics and now I'm motivated, motivated by the environment and I happen to also eat healthy, but morality is really my main focus. I think that um, morality plays a different role in people's lives. There's something in the book, in the book I, I cite to various um, studies, someone came up with the term moral identity and it refers to how important is morality to you? Is it very important? Is it not that important? If it's very important, an issue like this, you're more likely to consider it or take action. If it's not that important, why would you consider it in the first place? So I think with, with um, moral vegetarians, that's a big part of it. I think there's another factor, um, and, and this is hard to quantify. I actually think people have different levels of compassion and they also have different levels of compassion in different areas. Some people might have great compassion for humans, but not for animals. Um, you might have great compassion maybe for just your family, but not other humans. There's different types of compassion. I think that the people who become moral vegetarians, when they see an animal suffering, they really feel it. Um, and I think people feel it very differently. Um, I remember one time driving down a road and passing the car with a dead deer on the roof. You know, a hunter had, had killed the deer, was coming back. You know, I was distraught. It just really bothered me. The person I was with, not so much. So I think there's this visceral, visceral reaction. And the stronger that reaction, the more you're gonna consider veganism. I, I've always wondered about um, personalities that are true empaths. No, so not just empathetic, 
right? Towards a, f- a feeling and experience of another and having compassion towards their, their suffering. But uh, an empath, for those of those that don't know, um, you an empath will literally take on the experience or the pain or the joy uh, mm. of, of, of another. And after reading the, the empath survival guide by Judith uh, Orloff, cause I realized, I don't know, maybe six years ago that, that I was an empath and I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know um, where all this pain was coming from and carrying it around it was when, when I kind of went down the rabbit hole, like we'll say here on the show and understanding uh, what goes on behind closed doors in animal agriculture, uh, it was, it was like a veil was lifted like this, you know, the, the hazy glasses were taken off and it, and I, and I understood the truth. And it was, it was just a, an instant experience that I had. Um, and, and I, I feel it deeply almost daily, which is one of the reasons I've, I've definitely stopped watching the, the, the horror videos. So I grew up, as you were saying before, like my history, Southern, uh, ate meat and dairy and eggs and everything for 35 years. If you feel like the, an aspect of, if that person is a true empath, could that be, uh, one of the, one of the genes, maybe, uh, one of the DNA pieces that makes someone, you know, go vegan ethically and, and stay that way is. Yeah. I think it's important. It kind of goes back to people when they see animal suffering, how do they react? Are they compassionate? Are they empathetic? Um, you're, you're, when you were talking, I was thinking about something I wrote in the book. Um, and this is something that a lot of people don't really understand. When I see people eating meat, I don't see meat. I see an animal mm-hmm. and I see an animal suffering and I feel it. So if you're feeling that all the time, it must be very hard to carry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I feel it in those situations. So being empathetic, it, it's very hard. Um, I think you can be, emp- I, I think you can be empathetic, but not necessarily compassionate. So I think there are some people who might understand animal suffering, but not have compassion for it. And th- this is an area, it's just not clear. I did some research. I didn't come up with a lot of information. Um, one thing they found, they suspect that there's a gene for empathy, but mm-hmm. I couldn't find anything corresponding for compassion. Mm. Um, so I would I would think that researchers, for example, on animals would understand logically that animals suffer because they see it. But you're saying that they don't have empathy for them. They don't care. And or they might, but they also don't feel that it's important. What what what's the difference between compassion and empathy? I guess I'm not um, seeing the Empathy is when you feel what someone else is experiencing. Compassion is when you want to, want to end that suffering. Mm. It's two different things. Mm. Yeah, um, Com- but compassion again, would be more care, like you you caring about something right. versus and, actually right. experiencing. Yeah. But you know, it's an interesting area to investigate. I don't know how much how much studies there have been. Um, yeah. But you know, as I said, I you know, I consider myself compassionate. I have to work on empathy. But it is compassion. I consider it compassion that really drives me. I understand animals suffer, and I do have compassion, great compassion for that, like mm-hmm. you do. I feel like as a big societal, like you said, a big societal component, but not only how we're raised, but also if we're willing to buck a trend. And a lot of people just love animals, and they would do anything for their dog. Uh, or their cat, and they would feel both compassion and empathy for their dog and their cat, but they aren't willing to um, extend that to cows and other things for societal reasons, but also probably speciesism. And you cover that in your book too, I think, right? Yeah, I do. Um, You know, the book is based on a bunch of interviews. I've interviewed, I think, 10 or 12 uh, people, vegetarians, vegans, and non-vegetarians, and one of the people getting to your first point, his name's Lex. He was actually a fighter pilot in one of the Iraq wars. And I was asking him, you know, well, do you ever think about becoming vegetarian? He goes, well, not really, because I was raised not to think about it. And I accept the way I was raised. So mm-hmm. in his mind, and, and I pressed him, I pressed him. And finally, he said, you know what? I'm really not going to think about it too much because it makes me too uncomfortable. That was his final response. 
Yeah. Now, the speciesism, I could talk for hours on speciesism. Um, and I added a chapter on speciesism. And I found out afterwards, just talking with a bunch of activists, that a lot of activists don't talk about it now that much um, because it's often misconstrued. And particularly now, when racism is really in the forefront of, of politics. Um, a lot of people, when you, when you compare the oppression of animals to the oppression of women or a particular race, a lot of people misconstrue that. And they think you're comparing people to animals, which isn't really what's happening. But let me, I'll give it a shot because I do think it is important. Um, you know, in the book, I pretty much tried to cover everything. I've been thinking about for 40 years. You know, I don't go into the depth that I could, but I try to cover everything. I thought it was important to talk about speciesism. Speciesism, I compare it to other isms. I compare it to racism, to sexism, to homophobism. What happens in all those isms is you take another group and you take an arbitrary extinct, um, distinction. It might be race, it might be gender, and you put them as other. And you use that distinction to justify treating them differently, treating them poorly. And we did that obviously in, in American history. We did it with people from Africa. We said, oh, they're different. And we use that to justify a treatment of them. Um, you know, we, we said women are different than men and clearly they are different, but it's irrelevant for moral purposes. Nevertheless, women um, couldn't vote in this country until a hundred years ago. It's hard to imagine. Uh, and you know, there's still sexism, it's gotten better. So what we're doing now, and everyone agrees at the time, the people in charge said, oh, there's nothing wrong with racism. There's nothing wrong with sexism. Now, of course, we say, no, those are bad things. What's happening today is we're saying, well, animals are different. And because they're different, we can treat them poorly. We can kill them. You know, we can, we can treat them as they're treated. And one of my theses is, well, just as society was wrong 100 years ago, 200 years ago, about how we treated certain classes of humans, today, society is, again, getting it wrong about how we treat animals. Yeah. I had a, a, a dog trainer come over uh, late last week. I have a new uh, rescue dog and, and uh, she's, I think we think she's part beagle and terrier and she's really super curious and really smart. And I want to learn some ways to enrich her life more than just walk her all the time, which she loves to death. And we started talking about food and what I feed the dogs and, and kind of his history. And he just has placed almost every single animal. So, so, so dogs and cats, and then every animal that we eat, he just has them categorized like we did with people. Well, and many people still today are doing with people. And I, I started asking him about the different times he's been able to spend with some of these animals that he had very specifically categorized. And the answer was no time ever. Uh, which is, you know, it, it's, it's fine. That's his, you know, he just hasn't gotten a chance to, or probably hasn't thought that there was, be, there would be a reason to. Uh, but I, I feel if everyone, yes, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, maybe we wouldn't eat meat, but maybe many still would based on what you're saying. But if every person had the opportunity to go to a sanctuary and meet these animals and spend even a day with them, that for me changed everything for me in understanding the, the complexity of their personalities and, and their, their, their richness and their, their ability to ex love and be loved and laugh and they're in all their own different ways and um, have hierarchies and really very complex relationships and intimate relationships. And, that is something that I think is, is, I mean, that might be one of the main things that is missing from society today in terms of now we're trying to help people to understand the equality of all different types of, of species. And, um, but we still have them in order, right? We still have them in their own boxes in order and, and we just keep them there. 
Yeah, I agree. I think it's a big factor that people don't realize just how rich the lives of animals are. In fact, we can go back to, um, and I write about this, we can go back to Descartes in the 1600s. And at the time, animal experimentation or vivisection was really taking off. And Descartes, um, you might be familiar with him from, I think, Therefore I Am. He also uh, contributed to Cartesian geometry. He was brilliant. And nevertheless, as brilliant as he was, he came to the conclusion that animals don't feel pain. He said that when dogs howl, they're not actually feeling pain. They're just automatons reacting. And in fact, he himself performed animal experiments. I, I write about one in the book, and it's hard to believe a man of that intelligence could deny animal sentience, but people do. And, you know, something, I had a conversation with a friend of mine after I wrote the book, I would have incorporated it. He was telling me that when he was in elementary school, he was taught that we shouldn't anthropomorphize to animals. So when it looks like animals are, you know, showing pleasure or pain or some sort of emotion, he was taught, no, that's not really happening. We're simply anthropomorphizing, which I couldn't believe. Um, so I, I do agree the personal connection with animals is very important. On the other hand, what's, what's interesting, and, and this is, I talk about this and I'm not sure how to resolve it. Over half the people in this country have a, a cat or a dog in their household. And they know that that cat or that dog leads a rich emotional life. So they are aware of it, but for some reason they block that out when it comes to farmed animals. And it's hard to understand. But I know that when homophobia became accepted, it's when people met a gay person in their workplace or recognized them in their family, when people started coming out, then they started going, oh, they're just like us, or they deserve the same rights as us. And I think if we can get that out more about animals and the stories and the internet, hopefully we'll help. So many people's favorite animal are birds. I love to ask people, that question, like, what's your favorite animal? Sometimes you get, you know, you get dogs or cats, but a lot of times you'll get birds. Oh. And oh. I always just let them know that a chicken's a bird. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you know, <they> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, David, David, tell us about some of the theories of, uh, because you were talking about Descartes, the theories on the moral reasons to go vegan, because there's, um, you talk about it in the book, feminist, I wasn't familiar with these, these terms, feminist care ethics, equal consideration of ethics, moral relevance, and zoo, zoo, zoopolis? Yeah, zoopolis. Right. Well, originally, I was influenced back in, I don't know when it was, I think it was Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. And he takes what's called a rights approach, that animals have rights, but he uses a utilitarian approach. I don't want to get too technical into philosophy, um, but that's a certain type of, of moral philosophy, utilitarianism. Then um, Tom Regan came along and he wrote a book, The Case for Animal Rights. And it's also very rights-based, but based on inherent rights, just slightly different. Um, the feminist ethic of care, which I actually didn't know about, to tell you the truth, I researched it for this book. Um, it doesn't take as much of a rights approach as a more individual approach. Look at this particular situation and what's the best thing to do for that animal. Um, the other one, I think zoo, zoopoly, um, that, that's just another theory where basically says there's, there's three different types of animals. There are animals who live totally in the wild apart from humans. There's animals that live among humans, but not really part of them, like squirrels or raccoons. And then there's animals um, who are domesticated. And each set of animals should be treated differently according to their situation. So there's all these different approaches to, to moral philosophy. And where's the sentience one? Sen well, sentience is kind of interesting. Um, sentience is kind of, it's a prerequisite. If, if you go to Singer and Regan, sentience is a prerequisite to have rights in the first place. So for example, the, the reason we give a being rights is because that, and that being feels, and because it feels, it suffers. 
if a being didn't suffer, there would be no reason to give it rights. So um, Regan spends a lot of time talking about sentience and, you know, and basically at this point, I think most people agree that animals have sentience and that is a prerequisite. Where you draw the line is an interesting philosophical question. And I talk about it a little in the book. Regan draws the line at mammals who are a year of age or older and he applies rights to them. Now he doesn't discount that animals lower than that, um, I, I don't like to use the word lower, but animals less developed than that, you know, shouldn't have rights, but that's where he draws the line for purposes of his philosophy. But I think he's, he's a vegan nevertheless. And there are some interesting questions when you get down the line, what about oysters? Um, you know, what about single cell um, organisms? But as a, you know, this is all philosophical. As a practical matter, the animals that we eat, cows, pigs, turkeys, chickens, they're all very sentient. They all want to live and they all suffer irreparably um, when they're farmed. And then of course, when they're killed for food. I would love to talk about how, how religion, maybe the three main um, dominant religions in the world. I, I know this was something that I guess you've been thinking about for 40 years. <laughs> you said it was yeah, in your yeah. book and you brought all of these, um, you know, subjects, uh, you know, up to the, up to the cream. And I think about this uh, quite often and especially in a, um, a very uh, devoted uh, born again, Christian uh, mom, dad, um, yeah, yeah, I was going to say family, but not my, my not my immediately immediate family with my husband. But uh, what are the what are the the takes, I guess, if you will, uh, from the three dominant religions on eating or not eating and exploiting animals? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I'm very interested in religion, also. Um, I learned. I actually learned a few years ago. I was interviewing someone, and. In the Bible, people were originally vegetarians. And there's a, I quote, whatever quote it is, I don't memorize, it's something like, the nuts and the seeds will be for you meat, something like that. And according to the person I spoke to, that was God's intent that people would be vegetarian, but they didn't, they weren't vegetarian and they became more and more morally depraved until of course we had the great flood and when we had the great flood afterwards, God said, um, well, I won't have a great flood anymore. And he also lowered his standards and said, well, you know, you can go ahead and eat meat. So according to the person I spoke to, you know, there is a grounding in the Old Testament for vegetarianism. Um, the well, other- Eden, Eden only, Eden had apples. Yeah. Although if you ate the apple, you became a sinner. So that might not be a good, <laughs> good selling point for being vegan. <laughs> Cut the apples out. <laughs> uh -oh. So the other religions I, I talk about um, are the Eastern religions. There's Hinduism, which is a vegetarian religion. There's Jainism, which is even stricter. I actually think, I, as I talk about in the book, and as you can see in the background, I'm heavily influenced by, uh, by Buddhism, by the Dharma. And I don't buy it all, but a lot of it makes a lot of sense. And they talk about rebirth. And I don't believe in rebirth. Um, but if there were rebirth, there's a good chance I was a Jane in a past life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of interesting. And it, and it bears, it bears um, it's worth talking a little about. It goes back to how you were raised. I taught for a year at um, a private high school on a, um, in a monastery, the city of 10,000 Buddhas. And one day the question of rebirth came out and all of my students were either Asian American or actually Asian. So I asked them, how many of you believe in rebirth? Now, if this was, you know, uh, if this was a public school somewhere, no one would raise their hand. So I'd look around every single person raised his hand. They all believed in rebirth. So it does tell you, you know, just how, just how much what you're taught affects you. But um, in Buddhism, there's actually a disagreement over vegetarianism. Um, when I first started meditating, 
I came, this was 20 years ago. I'm a serious meditator. I started meditating 20 years ago and Buddhism has five, what are called precepts, kind of like the 10 commandments. The first precept is not to harm or not to kill. And it's understood not to kill animals. So I looked at that and said, whoa, Buddhism is vegetarian religion, right? That's kind of straightforward. A couple of years later, I was at a retreat and I saw one of my teachers eating a fish. And I realized at that point, not everyone thinks Buddhism is a vegetarian religion. And as it ends up, there's two lineages and I'll, I'll just summarize this. One is Mahayana, which is Tibetan and Zen. And in that tradition, the Buddha says, be vegetarian. In the other tradition, Theravada, the Buddha says, well, you can, you, you can eat meat if you know that it wasn't killed for you. So um, there's a big, you know, there, there's a big disagreement. What does that mean that. for you? Does that mean if you find a dead animal, you can eat that animal? Or That's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, in my interpretation, and I should say, I also co-founded an organization called Dharma Voices for Animals. And our goal was to get people within the, the Dharma community, meditators, um, to start thinking about these issues. So we talk to people all the time about, well, what does it mean? Was it killed for you? When you go to the supermarket, was that animal killed for you? Well, certainly the person who killed it, the slaughterer, didn't say, well, you know, I'm doing this for David, right? He did it, well, I'm just doing it for the generic consumer. But in a bigger sense, it is being killed for you. And if everyone stopped eating meat, no animals would be killed. Anyway, this, you know, this gets into kind of, this is a way, as I see it, for Buddhists who want to keep eating meat to justify eating meat. But um, from my point of view, Buddhism is a vegetarian religion. You mentioned reincarnation, and I wondered if you could just talk about that the fact that vegetarians used to be called Pythagoreans. I, I only know it about the Pythagorean theory, which I thought was a math, something with math, which I've forgotten what it actually is. So explain the connection. Okay, so this was back in ancient Greece, and most of them were vegetarians, Plato, Socrates. I'm not sure about Aristotle, we had a little different view. And there was this man named Pythagoras, and it is the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared on a right triangle. So he, he founded a society and the society, they were all vegetarian. They were all also very um, athletic. And what was revolutionary at the time is he let women in the society. This was unheard of back then. He was very progressive. If I have to look at my role models in history, he's right there near the top. Um, so he had the society and it, it lasted beyond him. And up until I forget what, when it was, um, I think the 17 or 1800s, there was no word for vegetarian. Vegetarians were called Pythagoreans. And then it wasn't until I think the 1950s where someone, where I think it was a vegan society of the UK came up with the word vegan. And really, you know, up until then, animals, they, they've been mistreated, but it really rose to a new level. And that's why the word vegan had to, had to come into existence because of the treatment of animals. I'm not sure back in ancient Greece, whether there would have been a moral imperative not to eat milk if the animals were treated well. But now with factory farming, um, it's a necessity. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that uh, the Pythagoreans believe that the body and the soul functioned together and that a healthy a body required a healthy mind, a healthy psyche. And I love that because it, it really kind of, I think is an example of that what you put in your body <laughs> affects your soul, right? So if you're putting in pain and anxiety and misery and suffering, there is going to be a soul function of those experiences that, that is gonna potentially come out. Right, in Buddhist terms, that would be karma. Yeah. Um, but you know, with the Pythagoreans, they believed in, in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And this was actually one of their justifications for not eating animals because that animal could have been someone that you knew. So you'd actually be eating someone that you knew. And that's actually, um, Buddhism has a very similar teaching. There's actually a theory that Pythagoras was influenced by the Buddhists, but that's another story. 
I do believe in reincarnation. So that is very compelling for me. Wow. Did you- <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you all sorts of things about reincarnation. <laughs> Oh, my smokes. Oh. You, you mentioned the, how the word vegan came to be. Um, I, in your book, you, you, you share that story. Can you tell us how did, how did someone decide that people who don't eat and, or exploit animals at all, cho- how'd they choose the word vegan? They chose it. I think they took the um, first three letters of vegetarian and the last two letters of vegetarian came up yes, with vegan. I, yeah, I never knew that. I didn't know that. So can we talk a little bit about your work um, as, as a, uh, a, a, an animal law attorney? Sure. Um, so you, you, you brought the first case against a foie gras producer, and certainly um, California has outlawed the eating and, and raising of animals for foie gras. Is that correct? What, was your, what were your legal reasons? Because there's so much cruelty, I can't imagine that it was just it's cruel because so many things are cruel. What made this more cruel than other things that didn't see, that doesn't seem very legal? Um, yeah, um, it was an interesting case. I, I remember it very well. A young man came to me who actually had footage of how the ducks were living. It's very hard to watch. Um, you know, they with foie gras, their livers I think become ten or twelve times their normal size, so they could hardly walk and they couldn't defend themselves from rats who would actually be eating them. It was just, it was horrific to watch. Um, And as an animal lawyer, there are challenges. Um, One of them has to do with standing. In other words, if someone does something to your neighbor, you can't sue, you don't have standing. It really has to happen to you. Animals aren't recognized by the law. They're objects or things and they don't have legal standing. So one of the challenges is to find ways of having legal standing. Now, if I remember correctly, um, in this particular case, there's a law called the unfair competition law. And it basically gives standing to anyone to sue a business that's violating the law. And we, we made the argument that the way the animals were treated violated anti-cruelty statutes. And because they violated anti-cruelty statutes, it was unfair competition and we could, we could bring a suit. Now, I don't know what would have happened if the suit had progressed, but fortunately, and I'm not sure what was happening on the other side, um, you know, maybe they just had an epiphany that what they were doing wasn't, wasn't a good thing to do, but they decided to settle But as part of the settlement, we brought in the California legislature. And part of the settlement would be that the California legislature legislature would ban the production and sale of foie gras. And I think there were very few, if any, other foie gras producers in the country. But as a result of that case, California passed that law. Now, since then, it went through a tortured history. It was challenged, and I think it was overturned. But I think as of three years ago or a few years ago, it's still law. So that was actually my favorite case for that reason. You know, it had the biggest impact. Well, um, I, I have an idea of why they might want to settle. A lot of these companies don't want to go farther because then it will be revealed to the public about what's going on behind closed doors. I'm, I'm amazed that they agreed to a settlement that they would actually be put out of business. Yeah, I was too. Um, again, I, I don't. I don't know what motivated them. Maybe I have, I have my theories that really that they just kind of said, "Oh, you know, oh, this isn't a wholesome way to make a living." I'm hoping that's what motivated them, but mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, or, or realizing that the 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 jury was going to have everybody has some kind of conscience, and that there was just no possible way that they were going to come out winners. You ha- you cover uh, a, f- a few different cases uh, in your book on um, stories of uh, the legal reasons that animals should have rights. Will you share with us a, um, a few of those, a few of your favorites? One of the cases, which, which I thought was very interesting, it didn't get very far, was the rodeo case. Um, what was happening, have you ever been to a rodeo? Sadly, yes. Yes, me yeah. too. Okay, I went when I was, um, I guess, 20. I went to one. I, I hadn't really thought about it in advance, knowing what I was getting into. I couldn't believe it. I left after 10 minutes. 
Um, but the city of San Francisco, I think, I think they're still doing this. They would actually take students to the rodeo on a field trip. It's hard to believe. Um, and, you know, there were times where the animals would be injured. There were occasions where the animals would die right then and there. So we brought a suit. Um, and again, I think it was, oh, again, we had a problem because we couldn't, we couldn't sue them because they were hurting animals. We had to come up with some creative way to do it. As it ends up, there's a statute that says teachers have to teach the humane treatment of animals. So we use that statute to bring suit and said, hold it, by bringing students to the rodeo, you're teaching the inhumane treatment of animals. Now, unfortunately, the judge disagreed, um, mm -hmm. which, which commonly happens. And I was leaving my practice at the time, so no one could take it up on appeal. You know, a lot of these cases, when you're breaking new law, a lot of them, a lot of judges will just stick with what, you know, existing law, and it's up to the Supreme Court to make a final determination. Um, another one of my cases, um, Adidas was using um, kangaroo leather on their, some of their soccer shoes. And in California, kangaroos were on the California Endangered Species Act list. So we sued, says, no, you're violating this. We lost at the trial court. He just threw it out. Uh, at the first level of appeal, we lost three to nothing. It went all the way to the Supreme Court of California, and we won 9-0. So, you know, it takes, takes perseverance and, um, you know, you David, really just so you know, Dotsie and I are very involved with that, that issue and soccer stores are selling so much kangaroo leather. Um, it's appalling. It's absolutely, and they are selling kangaroo leather. Wow. Is that in California or other yep. states? Yeah. After the case, Adidas lobbied Congress, you know, this, the state legislature to take kangaroos off the endangered species list. And they actually did. But then something happened in the last few years where kangaroos are back on the endangered species list. So, you know, it is a hot topic. I'm sorry to hear that it's still going on. In 2016, it became illegal again, but, mm -hmm. uh, it, but it's, it's, it's atrocious because exotic skins have been illegal and certain exotic skins, kangaroo among them, since the seventies and then you know, your case, thank you, um, pushed uh, a push for it to, was your case in the 70s? Because that was no, when no, it first- 2000. 2000, how interesting. Yeah. Mm. I'm gonna edit this so we won't, they don't have to hear my, my music, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, well, thank you for, that sounds like a really yeah. important case too. Um, thank you. Well, you were the former executive direction of, uh, you were, are the former executive director of Vegan Action. And Vegan Action certifies foods as vegan. Thank you, by the way, because last week I was just buying some D3 and I was so relieved to see that V on the label that I didn't have to go and start Googling what the D3 was made out of, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's been really helpful for, for me. You chose that, that V. Um, tell us a little bit about, about that certification. Okay, we, we decided to try this. This was back, again, there weren't many vegan organizations and there are very few vegan businesses. We thought that a logo similar to the kosher logo would be helpful. Would it be helpful for vegans who are shopping, but also would help spread the vegan word. And by the way, I don't know if you can see on this shirt, I'll stand up, the logo, yeah. the logo is on this shirt. Um, so we basically decided to come up with the logo and a bunch of, uh, it was a process. Um, all sorts of people contributed. And finally we came up with the design and then I just went ahead and I um, trademarked it. And I wasn't there that at Vegan Action that long. It was right before I became, uh, I decided to go back into animal law or into, you know, back into law. And Chrissy Vandenberg took over and she's been running it ever since. This is 20 years now. And she has over 10,000 products that are using that, that logo. Tell us, a, we have uh, just a, a dilemma as uh, these food, new foods come onto the market. Uh, Dotsie and I were talking before the show, there's something called Brave Robot Ice Cream, which uses Perfect Day Dairy, which is technically, it's made with non-animal it's, it's whey protein. 
but it's not plant-based, I guess is right. Is, is, is these kind of, are these kind of products going to be eligible for vegan action label? Not if they're using any animal products. The, the vegan, we also had a, a big discussion back then, how strict to be. Um, because when you're a vegan, there's all different levels of strictness with vegan. I have vegan friends who, when they go out to a party, will eat a cookie, knowing that the cookie has an egg in it. But, you know, otherwise, they're 100% vegan. Um, so when you start getting to the margins, there are differences. And I try not to dwell on those differences. You know, in the long run, you know, you don't want, you don't want people to think that you're just crazy, you know, that you're extreme out there because you're dwelling on these small points. I personally stay away from anything that has an animal. I don't want to contribute at all to animal suffering. So, and vegan action takes a pretty similar stance. Um, they do this not just for moral reasons because people want to know, there are, there are lots of people like me who want to just know that when there's the logo on there, it's safe to eat. Um, you know, where you draw, where an individual draws the line, it's a very personal choice. And I, I do talk about that a good deal in the book, um, but I try not to get hung up on it. You know, people, the main thing is that you know, people stay away from, from the big stuff. I would like them to be hundred percent pure, but stay away from the big stuff. Yeah. David, I'm, I'm curious about your, your hopes for the future since you've been thinking about all of these subjects for so long and, and thank you so much for uh, writing this book and bringing, bringing all of these, this, this thinking and these philosophies and these aspects of, of, uh, of veganism together. What, what areas of, of, um, what areas in general, I guess I should say, what areas of what we've covered today do you have the most hope for, for the future for change to actually take place? Well, I think that, um, I think change will happen. I'm not, I, I'm not optimistic that it will happen for ethical reasons. I think the human species is thousands of years away from that. However, I think the environmental reasons are becoming stronger and stronger. And we haven't really uh, talked about that, but one of the facts I learned, I didn't know this before, is that animal agriculture contributes more to greenhouse emissions than the transportation sector. In other words, it's worse for the environment to eat meat and dairy products than it is to drive your car. So I think environmental concerns are going to be a big motivation um, I also think, it, I haven't seen studies on this, but I suspect most vegans are actually motivated by health. And, you know, I, I watch the NBA a lot. So I'm watching stories of all these NBA players who become vegan. And I used to be a tennis player. So Novak Djokovic is a big vegan. Um, Carl Lewis became vegan and he had his best times after becoming vegan. I think that will motivate people. I think ultimately, however, it's going to come down to economics. I think what's going to happen is they're going to find alternative meats and they're just going to be so much easier to produce. They won't take land and water and all those things that that will be the primary motivation. So I actually think I'm pretty optimistic that we'll become more and more plant based. And there's a chance, I don't know, 50, 100 years that will be primarily plant-based. How's that for optimism? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping in 20 years, I don't know so if we'll good. survive mm -hmm. unless we do do it in 20 years. So it's not very optimistic of me. <laughs> <laughs> and the antibiotic resistance is also a big issue with, that a lot of people don't realize yeah. can really help humans uh, if we stop feeding all those antibiotics to livestock um, mm -hmm. and pandemics, I mean, we still, it seems like the jury's still That's out right. on whether it came from the wet market or the lab, but nonetheless, it came from an animal. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we yeah. stop testing on them, stop eating them. Then we wipe that out. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. David, <laughs> power. <laughs> David, thank you so much for being on our That's show great. and thank you for writing the vegan imperative. I think our audience is going to be very interested in going out and reading the book because there's so many things that we touched on that go deeper in the book. Oh, yeah. well, okay. Can I, I actually, can I plug the, the website? Sure. Um, yes. We always want to ask like what, you know, how can people find you and how can they learn more and please do. Okay. The, the site is veganimperativebook.com. There's also a Facebook page. 
Um, and you can also buy the book online pretty much anywhere, Amazon, all these sites. But if you go to the webpage, there are links to some of the more popular sites. And just another plug um, is that I mentioned that I'm very into meditation and I'm actually, I actually offer a free online course. And I did this during the pandemic because I realized people were at home and it was a perfect thing to do. There aren't that many free courses out there. If you go to the website and go to the about page, you'll see a link to a free meditation course for those interested in meditation. I just That's wanted to, to, to plug that. That's so good. I'm excited that you did because I think I want to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> thank awesome. you so much, David. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you guys for your work. I mean, what you're doing is great. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>